Um, so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to leave it to you and to Jinan to okay. uh, start tonight's uh, program. And I'm going to uh, disappear for a little while. Uh, we will be taking questions online uh, at the end of the presentation, and I will be passing those um, uh, along to you. So see you in a little bit. So um, it's my honor to uh, introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, so Jean Andu is the Outreach and Engagement Manager at the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and, Cosmo and Cosmology at Stanford, also known as KIPAC. KIPAC? Or, yeah, KIPAC. And uh, she got her PhD in astronomy in 2018 from UCLA, which is a really good school. Um, and her research focused on basically, I would say, cosmology. Is that correct, Gina? Um, It's a little bit of a smaller scale compared to cosmology, but really far away galaxies. Okay, so uh, of interstellar and circum circumgalactic gas and distant star forming galaxies. So before moving here to Northern California, she was down at UC Riverside, which is an okay school, <laughs> as a postdoctoral scholar. Uh, and Jinan is very passionate about outreach. That's one thing that's going to come across to you tonight. And, uh, and, and, and like a lot of us, uh, she's very, very passionate about the important role of outreach in terms of inspiring uh, science education. Uh, Jinan, what I do is I dress up as a wizard and use magic and explosions to teach kids astronomy. And so I call myself the Astro Wizard. And Carolyn Shoemaker named an asteroid after me uh, in honor of the weird, crazy things that I do. Um, so, uh, by the way, if you ever need me to do something over Stanford along those lines, I'd be happy to. Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, anyway, so she's hoping to inspire and engage everyone in learning astronomy through various outreach programs. And and she's very passionate in that regard. We're very lucky and honored to have her. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Jean Andu. Go ahead, Jean. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Dave. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be speaking with you tonight. Um, well, I have to put a disclaimer before we get started that uh, astrobiology is not something that I do research on, uh, but it is indeed a field that I'm just completely amazed by given um, that it actually requires the experts from different backgrounds and fields to work together. And um, also by the, all the possibility that it's uh, allowing us uh, to put our you know, reasoning and imaginations there. Um, and also how little we actually know uh, about, especially on the biology part. Um, so let me first start um, with sharing my screen. And um, so, I actually heard from Dave that uh, there have been quite a few speakers in the past couple of years um, speaking to you about astrobiology and SETI. So I will hopefully discuss the topic of astrobiology tonight um, from a slightly different angle without repeating a lot of the information <coughs> that you already know. So um, with that, um, when I was thinking about, you know, this topic, extraterrestrial life and where to find it, I've been thinking, um, what are some of the questions that we should all ask ourselves if we were to address this topic? So there are something that I could come up with, which includes, well, what is our current definition of life? Um, what are some of the components or necessary conditions that life would need to survive and evolve, um, what conditions would make a planet a good or potentially habitable planet? And based on that, um, how would we describe or quantify as a good sun to host such a planet? And if we have already known some potentially habitable places either inside or outside of the solar system. So those are some of the questions that I'm going to uh, go through today and perhaps also provide uh, some of the, the new insights uh, there. And feel free to drop any questions um, in the chat. I'd be happy to answer them afterwards. So um, when it comes to the definition of life, um, we probably all have our own perspectives. We could say, okay, well, based on a cat, um, I can say, well, all life, it, it needs to consume energy, it can move, it, it should also be releasing heat. But whenever we're looking at a non-life, 
for example, a car, it all fits into these three uh, criteria. So that is not necessarily an ex exclusive description of life. And then we may add, okay, well, it would have to be made up by cells, but then some of those wooden furniture, they're also made up by cells, but you also know it's not life. We could also say, okay, well, it would have to be able to grow in size, but again, a balloon can also grow in size, but we wouldn't characterize it as life. So there are a lot of, you know, this kind of like blurry lines here um, when, we, when it comes to defining life, but at least there's something certain that we currently know about life. So in biology, at least there is some kind of consensus on the fundamental properties shared by almost all living organisms on earth. So we have these six um, almost fundamental properties out of which um, reproduction and also evolution, um, evolutionary adaption, they are considered the most essential ones. So life, they must be able to reproduce um, and are products of reproduction. Mm -hmm. And they should also be able to gradually evolve um, to make the species a better suited for the environment. And evolutionary adaptation is especially important for any life form to survive over time. And when we're looking at um, the chemical basis of life, uh, most of us would think, well, okay, uh, life on earth is carbon based. So this pie chart right here, it shows uh, the chemical composition of human body by weight. Uh, and you can see, well, oxygen is actually more than 50% here by mass. So why don't we call ourselves oxygen based instead of we call it carbon based? Well, the reason is most of the oxygen in our human body is in the form of water. And although carbon is not the most abundant element in human body, it is actually essential for cell structure and function. And uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about that. So why does it have to be carbon? Well, first, carbon it has four electrons on the outer shell, which means that it could actually bond to four atoms at a time. Carbon can also form both single and double bonds, which means it can form a variety of chains and actually not only chains, but different patterns, including rings and also branches. Um, so based on that here, I would actually pose a question to all of you and feel free to directly type in the chat. Um, do you think a silicon-based life is possible? So remember that silicon also has four, four electrons on the outer shell. So would silicon also be a possible element where we might find one day um, there's a silicon-based life somewhere? So feel free to directly use the chat. Or if not, um, you can also just think about this. Um, Gina, yeah. and I can cheat because I have access to video, which is, so That's one, okay. and so I'm gonna cheat here. Okay. And while, while people comment. The first thing is, <clears throat> of course, as I recall, there's silicon based life in at least two episodes of Star Trek. So that for me is is pretty uh, determinative right there, um, and uh, I seem to re recall that uh, the silicon is directly below carbon on the periodic table, if I remember correctly. So yes. that is one of the reasons why some people have argued that silicon can be possible, but as I recall, also the chemistry is harder to make it work with silicon. Um, so yeah, I, that's that's correct. The silicon oxygen bond is much harder to break than the carbon oxygen bond. So uh, uh, diverse chemical reactions are more difficult. But perhaps not impossible. We right. don't know for sure. Um, so I'll okay. Let's see if anybody else has any comments. Uh, so far, no. Okay. If you're not cool. careful, I'll keep talking. 
Yeah, well, um, and if you have any comments at any point, feel free to drop in the chat. I also have it up so I can I can read those. But thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your insights, Dave. Uh, okay. And that's exactly what I was go going to be talking about. It is, um, well, we should say not uh, very likely, but it's certainly possible. Um, just because, you know, chemically, there's nothing that really uh, prevented from engaging in all this kind of uh, chemical reactions just as carbon does. However, there are several drawbacks that we would have to consider. The first of which is um, that the bond um, between the silicon and any other atoms it would be weaker just because the silicon atom is bigger in size compared to a carbon atom. So the electrostatic force is weaker um, between the nucleus and the electrons. So with this kind of weaker bond, any molecules that are formed, they tend to be fr fragile, or at least more fragile compared to what carbon would be able to do. Um, and silicon typically uh, only forms a single bond, which means that it would um, prevent a lot of uh, variety uh, in terms of chemical structure um, and also the molecules or um, you know, the chemicals engagement in chemical reactions. And finally, silicon dioxide is solid, but remember carbon dioxide is gaseous. So silicon dioxide is typically found in rocks, which means it's really um, you know, enabled to move um, or like to dissolve or engage itself in a lot of chemical reactions. And carbon dioxide, on the other hand, the CO2 cycle is very important uh, to be able to maintain a habitable environment for a planet. Um, it is carbon, carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. It can dissolve in water and it can also react with rocks. So overall, um, carbon based life definitely has um, a preference, well, I should say superior, superiority um, when we're consider, considering all these kinds of factors, but silicon based life is still a possibility. So moving on, um, the next question is, well, let's just assume that um, you know life is all carbon based to make it a little bit simpler. Um, but then, what components or what um, you know stuff that it actually needs? Well, there are three things, at least for now, we identified as essential. So first, um, there needs to be um, matter um, that provides the building blocks. There needs to be energy. Um, from somewhere to be able to provide uh, the initial source for metabolism. And there needs to be liquid media to transport all the chemicals and facilitate chemical reactions. So when we're talking about matter and building blocks, where can we find those things? Um, so on, well, in all the living organisms, uh, on Earth, most of the mass is actually made up by only four different kinds of ca um, chemical elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and also nitrogen. So basically, if we were to just find all these four kinds of elements in the universe, then boom, we just have the building blocks for life. The question is, are they hard to find? Well. Good news is um, no, because most of the pluroplanetary disk um, where planetary systems are formed, they're already chemically enriched, which means at least that they meet the lower limit for all this um, chemical abundance criteria. So um, the abundance for building blocks, at least that is not a limiting factor for us to find extraterrestrial life. Um, and the next question is, where can we find energy? So a planet uh, can receive um, sunlight, just as our Earth does, and we rely a lot on solar radiation. 
But aside from that, there's also available chemical energy um, that could uh, be used by deep sea um, microbes um, that live near volcanic beds, you know, almost out on the ocean floor. And that is uh, produced by reactants uh, being mixed and just through chemical reactions. There's also internal energy um, that one might be able to utilize from the interior of a planet. And that comes from either accretion, um, which means, you know, through the early history of planet formation, that there's a lot of uh, bombardment and, uh, you know, growth in mass and accretion just by, you know, accreting more mass, there's more energy to be utilized. There is differentiation, meaning um, for a planetesimal or proto planet um, to form, there is actually a differentiation process at the very center where you have all the heavier elements sink to the bottom or the core of the planet and all the you know, less heavy ones float to the top. So that would also create um, energy sources. And finally, there is radioactive decay. Uh, typically, um, it's from heavy nuclei, for example, uranium broken down into multiple lighter nuclei. And for our Earth, um, actually more than 50% of the current energy budget comes from radioactive decay. So that is definitely something, um, you know, non-negligible. And in terms of liquid media, um, we do need it for three functions. We need it to dissolve um, chemicals. We need it to transport chemicals. And we also need it to engage in chemical reactions. For example, um, here it actually shows um, how photosynthesis is done. So basically we're combining carbon dioxide and water to make sugar. In the, of course, in the presence of light and enzyme. But it also shows that without water, um, this reaction cannot happen. And the sugar is uh, one primary energy source that uh, most, of our, most of us are uh, living based on. Well, you may then ask, um, do we have to have water then? Can it be something else? Well, there are um, alternatives, uh, which includes all these uh, four kinds of liquid media, ammonia, methanol, methane, and ethane. But when we're considering how likely they are to provide a habitable um, environment for life, we want uh, the following things, well, based on our experience on Earth, First is that they need to have a pretty large temperature range for it to stay in the liquid form. So for water, um, it has this uh, temperature range of 100 degrees Celsius, which is great. But at the same time, we can also see that uh, methanol is even better. It has more than 100 degrees in this range. And even ethane is about 100 degrees then does that mean that they can also be, well, just a really good substitute for water? One thing that we need to keep in mind is that they might um, on other planets, but at least on Earth, because the global average temperature on Earth is about 15 degrees Celsius. These guys, both of these guys, they are actually a little bit uh, adapted to, you know, colder um, systems where, you, um, you know, like 65 degrees Celsius, um, that is still very easy for it to turn into a, a gaseous form. So you definitely do not want your, you know, essential liquid media to be gaseous very easily. Also, none of these alternatives are as common as water, at least on Earth. So currently we're considering them not to be a very viable option. There are other factors that we need to take into consideration. So aside from needing to have a high boiling point, um, water has another special property that is uh, when it's frozen, 
ice is lighter than liquid water, which means that it would just float to the top of the water in freezing environment, providing a shield to prevent the water underneath from further freezing. And that is actually important because it allows marine life to be able to survive even in this kind of a fro frozen um, environment. And for all the other media, um, liquid media alternatives that we were just talking about, none of them would actually have this property. Um, all the liquid form of theirs, they would sink to the bottom instead of floating on uh, the top. Finally, water has another special property that is, it is a polar molecule, meaning um, that it actually has um, charge separation. Part of, um, well, the, the oxygen end um, is slightly uh, more negatively charged and the hydrogen end is slightly more positively charged. And this is because of the, the whole structure of the molecule is asymmetric. So having this kind of a polar structure, um, it allows it to dissolve, um, you know, salt like uh, sodium chloride, um, which is an important electrolyte for living organisms on Earth. Molecules that are, are without uh, charge separation, for example, oil, they cannot dissolve in water. So all the alternative liquid media that we were just talking about before, they are all nonpolar molecules, which means that they would tend to dissolve membranes, um, which are made of lipid, at least the surface of membranes that are made of lipid. And that is a horrible thing. We definitely don't want this kind of um, essential uh, liquid media to be dissolving all our cell structures. So that's why so far we think, okay, water is still our best bet. And that's why we're looking for water almost um, anywhere else when we're looking for um, habitable planets. So moving from here, um, I would also like to um, bring about the question, which is what actually makes a habitable planet? So there are several factors that we need to consider here. The first one is how big the planet is. So with larger size and mass, um, there's typically more internal heat uh, retained in a planet, making its metal not completely solid, solidified. And for example, um, our Earth, the metal actually behave like liquids and their convections and the mantle that would drive plate tectonics, uh, plate tectonics and uh, volcanism. Well, through uh, outgassing, um, there, the carbon dioxide trapped in the interior of these planets, they can be released out um, and to the atmosphere. Also through rainfall, all these carbon dioxide, they can just uh, fall back to the surface and re react with uh, surface rocks, form carbonated rocks, which later through plate tectonics, be cycled back to the mantle. So that basically closed the whole loop for the um, CO2 cycle. And that is actually very important um, for regulating and maintaining a stable climate for life to be able to survive and thrive. If we're talking about a planet that is a little bit too small, then um, it doesn't have a lot of internal heat to keep the metal from being solidified. And once the metal is completely cooled off, there would be no ongoing plate tectonics and the CO2 cycle would also be non-existent. And the second um, criteria uh, we're gonna consider here is atmosphere. So having an atmosphere is very important for um, a planet because it can shield it from all the very hazardous um, um, and violent solar wind, um, which can just completely um, you know, destroy any surface life on this planet. 
So normally atmosphere uh, is produced um, by outgassing and assuming that there's already some kind of gas trapped in the interior of this plant, planet through the planet planetary formation process. And all you need is basically through um, uh, volcanism releasing this gas out to form this atmosphere. And a planet with a slightly decent mass would be able to um, use gravity to hold on to this atmosphere for a slightly longer time. And as we just talked about um, in the previous slide, the CO2 cycle would depend on atmosphere to actually be able to work. And also with the atmospheric pressure, it will make uh, liquid water in a more stable state on surface instead of just like completely um, vaporize very fast. And the second factor, um, sorry, the third factor is magnetic field. So um, for magnetic fields, um, it is essential to actually retain a decent and thick atmosphere um, because it actually shields the whole atmosphere from uh, solar wind um, stripping this entire um, shield uh, or um, atmosphere away. So magnetic fields, they are typically uh, created when they are, uh, there's a motion of liquid metal. Again, take our Earth for example, um, it has a very decent magnetic field just because the outer core of Earth is liquid. And with a relatively fast self-spin, um, there are electric current um, forming in this outer core region, which can later induce magnetic fields um, that forms to protect the entire Earth. And consider some other uh, planets, if they are not having any um, liquid form of metal at the core, or if their self-spin is a little bit too slow, then they may have a very hard time generating a decent magnetic field to be able to shield them from all the ch highly charged particles, fast moving that comes directly to the planet. Okay, so at this point, um, we may say, okay, well, you we've talked about all these criteria. Um, we know what may might make a good planet, um, but are there any potentially habitable planets in the solar system? And the answer is, of course, yes. And I am I'm sure that you guys have um, already heard. Uh, a lot about these. Um, so I'm just going to be quickly doing an overview. So first come to mind is Mars. Um, so human started exploring Mars since the 60s. Um, and there are a lot of missions trying to study the past history of Mars, whether there's uh, past water, whether there's current or past life. And uh, the two missions that I would like to highlight is actually Curiosity and P Perseverance. So they aim to investigate Martian geology and climate. They look for um, any kind of uh, form of life, evidence for past water, and um, also conduct um, a lot of uh, scientific experiments in preparation for human exploration. There has been multiple evidence um, for past water on Mars. So Curiosity did a very uh, careful examination of the Gale Crater. Basically, it just drove by an ancient uh, stream bed where it found uh, clumps of pebbles uh, with rounded surfaces um, that just look exactly like uh, the pebbles that you would find on Earth. And these pebbles, they typically form when there's running water. So this is one of the pretty compelling evidence that there used to be flowing water on Mars, but of course now it's all dried out. And even considering where uh, Perseverance landed um, in the Jezero crater almost two years ago, um, here is its landing site, 
And why I picked this site is because um, here you can clearly see um, the signs of past water flows and uh, the delta deposit. So uh, Perseverance is actually able to just drive around in this um, incredibly interesting scientific site um, to be able to collect a sample, um, drill down into soil, and then see whether um, there's for, um, any sign of past life. So that's why it um, initially ch uh, chose to be landing here. And aside from flowing water, um, studies have also shown that there's a very uh, interesting uh, signs of methane in the Martian atmosphere. So a few years ago, there was a discovery of Martian, atoms, uh, Martian methane in the atmosphere. What's exciting about this is methane is considered as one of the, the biosignatures, right? On Earth, um, only like livestock um, can provide a large amount of methane. And not only did we detect methane in the Martian atmosphere, we also discovered that it varies um, you know, throughout the day and it also has a seasonal variation. Currently, we do not really know um, whether this methane actually came, came from biological processes. Um, well, if it was, then that would be a breaking news and super exciting discovery. But we also need to be a little bit, you know, um, conservative about this to be able to completely rule out the possibility of, say, geological um, or chemical origins of the methane. So what do we actually know about Mars so far? Well, um, what we know is it must have been a habitable place in the past. Given all the signs for flowing water on the surface, it indicated that Mars must have been a thicker and also warmer place in, uh, in the past. But for some reason, it lost most of its um, atmosphere um, and now the surface pressure is just too low for liquid, liquid water to be stable. So with Perseverance, um, a returning sample to Earth to be analyzed, um, this is going to be a very um, interesting topic to be closely followed in the next few years. So um, stay tuned. Uh, there's got to be more exciting news coming from Perseverance. Okay, so let's now look at a, a couple other uh, possible habitable, uh, possibly habitable planets in the solar system. One being Venus, which is considered as a twin planet um, of Earth by having very similar size and composition. So previously, Venus was never considered as a habitable planet just because its atmosphere is actually more than 200,000 times thicker than that of Earth. And the temperature is more like a pizza oven. Uh, at least our human beings can definitely not survive. However, science always surprises us in, uh, in unexpected ways. So there was a study uh, last year that suggested the presence of one potential um, sign of life a gas called phosphine. And that was detected in the uh, Venus atmosphere. So on Earth, bacteria is able to produce it. But for now, um, again, we don't really know what the origin is for this uh, phosphine. The possibility of life on Venus still remains unlikely but possible. And we just need uh, further investigation whenever we find uh, more biosignature signals from this uh, twin planet of Earth. Aside from planets, um, there are also moons um, that orbit um, any solar system planets that are good places to look. For example, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn have received a lot of attention. One candidate is um, 
One candidate is Europa, uh, which is the second uh, Galilean moon of Jupiter. Um, just because it's pretty close to um, Jupiter, it's their gravitational interactions is strong enough that Europa is receiving a lot of tidal heating. And that is the friction created uh, at the layer, either at the boundary of the water rock um, layer or the interior of the moon that is able to melt ice. We also found out uh, that Europa's surface is incredibly smooth with only a few features like, you know, like small craters or uh, little mountains. So all these is hinting that Europa's surface must have been repaved very recently, which means that uh, there must have been occasional breakthrough of subsurface water or slushy ice to actually repave this surface. And one other in interesting um, finding about Europa is that it also has an induced magnetic field, which suggests that there might actually be salty under um, surface ocean uh, that is, you know, underneath this thick layer of ice uh, that would be able to conduct electricity. So for Europa, there's actually more mission uh, coming up just to study um, more about this uh, possibility and its environment. For example, NASA is launching a Europa Clipper, again, expected 2024. Uh, hopefully that is going to be um, uh, kept on time, uh, but we'll see. So this is an orbit orbiter to do close flybys of Europa to actually be able to study this moon's surface and ocean. So it will be able to get images and spectra of the moon and also look through um, Europa's ice to see how thick um, the ice layer is and what might be underneath. So the probe would also um, analyze the moon's magnetic field it, um, it also has a thermal instrument on board, which would probe the evidence of um, warmer water near the surface. And of course, this uh, clipper would also look for evidence of water in the atmosphere. So again, a lot of exciting uh, discoveries to be made. And on the European side, there is another, um, a uh, probe to be launched called JUS, and of course, this is one of the uh, astronomer acronyms. Um, the full name is the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Um, this will be launched by the European Space Agency, hopefully uh, next year. And it will not only study Europa, but also Callisto and Ganymede, uh, the other two uh, Jovian moons which scientists have already suspected uh, that it may harbor internal oceans. So again, we would be able to uh, get more details on these Jovian moons uh, from all these missions and actually gain new insights into the habitability of these worlds. Um, one thing um, that all these missions would have to overcome is that Jupiter has a really strong magnetic field. So um, all these probes would have to be protected in some way to survive that. Otherwise, uh, they would not be able to work for the expected lifespan. And aside from Jovian moons, one of um, Saturn's moons, Titan, um, has also received a lot of attention because in many ways it's extremely similar to Earth. So it has a surface pressure about um, 100, well, 1 1.6 times uh, that on Earth. It has a substantial atmosphere, even though there's no oxygen, it's made of 90% uh, of nitrogen. But because of this um, atmosphere, um, it will able to um, enable a lot of um, surface liquid media, um, for example, um, methane and ethane. And we actually observed a lot of channels and lakes uh, made of these liquids. 
Um, one other thing we noticed uh, is that it has icy volcanoes, just because at the place where uh, Saturn is from the sun, um, the temperature is already cold enough that liquid water, it has very little chance to survive on the surface. However, um, there could be ice um, that is still underneath and just through a uh, volcanism, there's a slushy ice actually getting erupted. And if we actually make a, a comparison between uh, the surface features of Titan and also Earth, we would see on Earth, we have liquid water and on Titan, we have liquid uh, methane and ethane. Um, we have rock, um, or magma um, through rock, the molten rocks uh, through uh, volcanic eruptions. And on Titan, we have ice, ice volcanoes. Um, we have uh, dirt and uh, sand dunes on Earth, and there are also smog particles on Titan. And what this is shown is um, actually some of the uh, the smoke um, sand dunes um, observed on the surface of Titan. So with that, of course, we need another mission uh, to study Titan a little bit more closely. Um, so in 2026, we're expected to uh, launch Dragonfly, which is a drone-like space uh, craft to study Titan's Titan's surface and atmosphere, um, and also look for signs of life. Just because given how far Saturn is away from us and also from the sun, so we're probably not actually gonna get any scientific data until the 2030s. But still, even just launching this probe would be able to give us a lot of um, new insights into what Titan actually is and what kind of life um, it might have been able to harbor. So the last part um, of my talk, I would actually like to talk about other habitable places outside of the solar system. So we already know that um, there are other star systems um, out there and just through different missions such as Kepler, K2 and TESS, we have confirmed more than 5,000 exoplanets so far. So um, what is um, very interesting here is that we don't really know um, which of the planets would actually be able to host life but we might be able to um, get a sense of that um, by, defining, by defining habitability based on uh, several different criteria. And before we get into that, um, I would like to pose another question, which is, well, to be able to have a habitable planet, you would also need to have a very good star to host that um, habitable planet. So um, we know that depending on the initial mass of a star, um, stars actually go through different evolutionary paths and they may end up either being a white dwarf, um, say our sun would end up being in a white dwarf in about 5 billion years, or it might just explode and turn into a black hole or a neutron star. So all these needs to be taken into consideration when we're talking about habitability or whether there's enough time for life to actually emerge and evolve. Um, so then what stars could be good suns? Well, there are several things. Again, you would need to have some kind of heavy elements, um, heavy elements being defined as everything except for hydrogen and helium um, because we, do need carbon um, or even heavier elements like, like nitrogen or oxygen. So currently we think maybe 0.5% um, by mass uh, of heavy element that is already enough to form habitable planets or at least is enough um, in terms of life building blocks. And for reference, um, the fraction for our sun is about 2%. And 
the star would also have to have long enough lifetime uh, to actually enable enough uh, span or period of time for life to develop on its planets. Um, so, so far we know, okay, if we have a star that is less than the star, the mass of the sun, uh, then it's going to have a longer stellar life, uh, lifetime, just because uh, the more massive a star is, uh, the shorter it lives. And if we are using this solar mass uh, cutoff, then 97% of the, the stars would make the cut. So we also have more than enough stars to actually consider. And the third one is we would need to have a steady energy output from this star to be able to form a steady habitable zone. And again, based on the brightness of the star, um, it would have different um, habitable zones. For example, a more massive star would have a um, wider habitable zone, but for those uh, you know, smaller, less massive stars, the habitable zone is much narrower. So you may ask, well, we just talked about you know, those stars with mass lower than the solar mass, but then if it has a very narrow habitable zone, then it also reduces the chance of a planet being in this zone, right? Well, that is absolutely correct. However, remember that there are 97% of the stars uh, that actually make the cut. So even though um, individual, each of them may end up having a narrower habitable zone, but overall, we still have a large um, number of possibly habitable planets surrounding these 97% uh, of stars. So that is, again, not a serious problem. Um, one other thing we need to be very careful about is around massive stars, just because they are very powerful and um, the peak radiation they would give out is actually in the UV instead of in the visible band. Um, so for our sun, we're lucky enough that most of the light it emits, it's invisible, it's in optical, but too much UV radiation, it would hurt any life on the surface of the a planet. And that is not something very desirable. And finally, we also know many stars are actually not a single star by itself. It's in a binary system. So for a planet to be able to um, be in a very stable state, it needs to be having a stable and possibly nearly circular orbit. For example, if we have a um, binary star that's like orbiting very close in with each other and a planet um, pretty far out, that is doable. If we have a planet uh, that is orbiting very close in only to one of the host stars, it's almost exact, you know, like uh, overlooking the other star, then this might also work. However, the trickiest part is if these two stars are decently separated and a planet is sort of like going through the middle or near the middle point, almost like, as like a figure eight um, orbit or something, then that is a very unstable orbit and it could be ejected very easily um, at any point. And of course that is not good for um, any life to develop on this uh, poor planet. And after talking about all those planets, one final thing to think about is that we know not only having um, a planetable, habitable, uh, habitable zone and a planetary system, but there's also something called a galactic habitable zone, which means um, stars and planets in this habitable zone are good enough to be you know, habitable stars and planets. Because if it's too far out there, that there were almost no star formation in the past, then you would not have enough heavy elements, not even making it to the 0.5% cut um, to form any kind of life. Or if it's too close where there's a lot of stars, star clusters, including massive stars, 
then you would also have to worry about, you know, being in the star cluster, there are always supernova explosions here and there um, that it would not really make your uh, planet, little planet safe for a long time. So um, with that, um, there are actually some quite exciting um, discoveries from uh, Kepler, TAS, and also K2, um, where now we currently know there are all different kinds of exoplanets. Some of them are looking like um, our solar system planets, some are not. Um, oh, I guess my, huh. Okay, well, I do have uh, texts here that are not showing up for some reason, uh, but I could, I could just say. Um, so there are a few very interesting categories. Um, one is called hot Jupiter, which means it's about Jupiter mass, but it's super, super close in to uh, its host star. And that makes um, the, the atmosphere of this hot Jupiter puffs up. So that's why it's um, almost like a, a gas giant, but very close to its host star. There's also super Earth, which is um, larger and slightly more massive, typically, you know, a double the mass of Earth um, that are good candidates for habitable planets. They are also um, uh, something called, uh, you know, the water world, which is primarily made of water. And there is also a hybrid type uh, between Jovian and uh, terrestrial planets. Basically, it's have it has a rocky metallic core, but at the same time, a very thick and decent atmosphere made of um, hydrogen and helium. So given that, um, we know there are so many exoplanets out there. Um, there are a lot of possibilities. And I know that no astrobiology talk can end without uh, bringing up this uh, Drake equation, but I'm not going through all these terms one by one. I simply wanted to point out that um, this whole Drake equation, the astral physical terms right here, that's something that we actually know um, what is going, well, I should say to some extent, know what is going on and be able to put some constraint on. But it's more on the bio biological side that we honestly just have no idea. So with um, you know numbers of galaxies and um, you know star formation in a single galaxy, we can easily use um, the Hubble Space Telescope or JWST and also cosmological simulations to simulate um, all those numbers. And JWST and Kepler will also be able to tell us more about um, how many planets um, there could be in a system and how many of them might potentially be habitable. And of course, models um, for planetary formation would also help answering all these questions. But on the right, you know, um, we simply just don't know we only have one data point for intelligence life, which is just our human being. We only have one data point, which is the earth that harbor uh, known life. So there's a lot of unknown things there, but even just um, we're able to, the fact that we're able to constrain these factors slightly better with JWST, it is already super exciting. So, um, I'm just gonna leave it um, with one last example showing it. Um, this result came out, um, I would say five, six weeks ago that JWC actually detected uh, carbon dioxide on an exoplanet. And that was the first time um, that we detected an ambiguous evidence for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of a planet that's not Earth. So this exoplanet is called WASP 39b. Um, it turns out that it is a hot Jupiter, that it might be too hot to host any life. And this carbon dioxide is probably not having a biological origin. But even just thinking about all the possibilities, say the spectroscopy that JWST will be able to do with exoplanet atmos atmosphere, 
there will be tons of new um, information that we're going to be getting and learning from you know, life in the universe. So to end, I am simply just going to uh, give a plug for this upcoming KIPEC lecture series on JWST early science. So if you're interested in learning more about JWST, especially on the astrobiology side um, related to exoplanets and also cosmology in terms of, you know, how galaxies form, how many of them there are there, I would highly encourage you um, to sign up um, for these lecture series. Um, I will share the information with um, Rich and Dave. Um, hopefully they can help me send that out. So I'll leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yunan. Let me put my video back on here. There we go. That that was a, a really nice talk. It was it was it's such a unifying topic um you know to discuss astrobiology and because it gets into the you know the engineering of what we have to do as well as the philosophy physics and chemistry of uh of uh what we'd like to discover and uh you put it all together really well um quick question about that uh uh, lecture series that you mentioned at the end. Um, there's just a couple of names I recognize there. Are, oh, yeah. Is yeah, is everybody there uh, involved with the Kavli Institute directly, or is you know I was uh, because it was one of our uh, other speakers uh, uh, works with uh, Bruce McIntosh, so I was, like, oh. I was seeing the uh, the overlap there, and uh, um, and that jumped out at me. Is he involved with Kavli as well? Yes, well, he just left uh, KIPAC. He was the deputy director, um, and he was at KIPAC ah, for, you know. I wasn't aware. Yeah, yeah more, more than a decade. But he is now hired as the new uh, UCO director. Oh, uh, awesome. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that event um, is going to be co-hosted by KIPAC and UCO. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll pass along the information to our membership through, uh, through an email. Yeah, so that way people Thank can you learn more much. about it. Um, so Dave, uh, I'm going to let you ask your questions directly since you asked most of them in the chat. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. There's no point in me relaying your questions because you're here. Okay. Um, uh, one of the reasons I, I chose uh, Nishi as a speaker is that this is a subject that has always fascinated me and always will. Um, and so that explains she why I have had several speakers on this subject, all of them looking at this from different viewpoints. But what was fun about your talk was rather than focusing in on, for example, why lipids are really a critical issue for the formation of life or you know various other aspects of this, uh, you had you gave a very nice journal talk that touched upon all of the different aspects uh, of these questions. Um, so I have, I do have a number of questions, forgive me for asking them. Uh, the, my first is, of course, like a lot of people, I'm very excited by, uh, by Europa. Um, mm -hmm. when I, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but one of the really exciting things about Europa is that, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the current thinking is that, that the water underneath that ice has probably been liquid for on the order of billions of years. Am I right on that? Uh, it, 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 could, it could be. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, uh, I have to say that, um, and so that gives, offers the possibility for life having arisen and not only being microscopic life, but very possibly life could have evolved and there could be all sorts of life underneath that ice there. A very, very exciting possibility. Um, uh, uh, actually, I have to say, uh, I'm going to put in a little brag here in that uh -huh. uh, uh, Gene Shoemaker was a friend of mine. And I remember when we were, I, I was at a conference, uh, actually it was, um, God, it was the conference we used to have in San Francisco. Uh, with AG, uh, AGU. AGU, thank you very yeah. much. And I was talking with Jeff Moore uh, of NASA Ames about Europa. And I said, how young is that surface? And he said, well, we're gonna have to add, the real expert on that surface would be Gene Shoemaker because he's an expert on cratering and he can tell you how old hmm. that surface is. And so uh, I said, it's funny that you're saying that because I'm going to be going to Flagstaff in a few weeks. I'm going to stop off and ask him. And so I was talking with Gene about that surface. I said, Gene, how old is that thing? Given Gene Shoemaker's cratering impact model. 
And he said, well, you know, he sort of handed hard. He said about 10 million years. And he said, but let's face it, it's young. And he said it that way. So Europa is a very, very exciting candidate. And my first question was, how long is the Europa, Europa Clipper expected to last? Oh, that uh, that's a really good question. I haven't really Googled it. <laughs> I did a, I did a little bit of Googling when Dave asked it, and uh, it's going to take uh, a little over five years to get there. Yeah. And then uh, the science uh, mission is four years once it gets there. And uh, and they'll try to figure out some way to extend it, I'm sure. But, but knowing how they build these things, it's like JPL when they say the mission's going to last 100 days and, and the craft lasts 10 years. Well, look at Voyager. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, right. So. Yeah. So, yeah, but anyway, uh, that's the official that's the official answer. Thank you, Rich. Sure. Uh, and, and by the way, as I always like to say, to say you don't know the answer to a question is the beginning of wisdom. Um, oh, then I must have a lot of wisdom here. <laughs> <laughs> just just I, uh, parenthetically, one time I was I, I gave a talk to uh, uh, the children of, of uh, a bunch of Stanford faculty. And I was talking about actually I was talking about Europa, among other things. And one 12 year old girl asked me this question about Europa. And she, she asked me this big, com complicated chemistry question and I, all the other questions I've been answering. But I went, I don't know. And there was this gasp in the audience. And all of a sudden. I thought, well, I, I've, I've dropped the ball here. But actually, people came up to me afterwards and said, we're glad that you said you don't know the answer to that because her daughter's the chairman of the Stanford Chemistry Department. And she's really, really smart. And uh, we didn't expect you to know the answer. And when you said you didn't know the answer to that, it gave greater validity to all the other answers you did answer to. So, <laughs> so K2, what the heck is K2? Oh, sorry. So uh, the Kepler mission... Um, well, at oh. the end, oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. So K2 was basically, um, an extension of the Kepler mission, um, that it was, uh, was still able to continue to, um, you know, observe and detect all those exoplanets. Um, even, you know, the official Kepler mission, um, had ended. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I, this is a moment for me to put in a, another plug. Uh, next month's speaker may be a researcher who's doing work with both Kepler and with TESS. Um, young researcher Wonderful. at NASA Ames. And I, forgive me, I, I, again, I'm just terrible with names. I can't remember his name right now. Forgive me. But that may be our next month's speaker. Um, so uh, what I, have a, uh, I have a question here from, okay. uh, from uh, Bill Evanson. Uh, he asks, what role does entropy play in the properties of life? Well, I think that's an interesting question. It is a very interesting question, and I'm probably going to use my wisdom here. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So, okay. Well, this is my personal thought. Um, well, for all the processes that happens in, say, like in a living organism, right, uh, and it increases entropy, but I don't know whether, say, if we measure or you know, big if, if we, if we measure entropy and we detect, you know, an in, increase um, entropy at a certain rate that would uh, signal, say, like the possibility of life. So I do not really see sort of like a correlation between these two. Um, mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't know how we would even measure <laughs> entropy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like in, we, could, we could measure it in, in a relative sense but not in an absolute sense. Sure. I have another it's, question. Go ahead, sorry. No, 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 there's other people. I, I always feel selfish when I'm doing this. No, no, you're not. Oh, okay, um, globular clusters. I, I'm, we're gonna have a speaker, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Kuhl is gonna be one of our speakers next year uh, from San Francisco State. She's an expert on globular clusters. And there's an <laughs> argument that globular clusters cannot host life because of the way the stars work there are is that correct or is it possible that globular clusters could host life is there some particular loophole that you know of in this regard um this is again simply you know just based on the content of what would what could to make a good sun right? right say you know if a globular cluster you know is like newly formed and there were still a bunch of like massive stars there 
uh, that would eventually explode, I would say, okay, well, just get out of there. <laughs> Don't try to even form life there, right? Because, you know, whenever that happens, uh, potentially it's just going to affect all the stars and planets in there. Yeah. However, after, say, like uh, billions of years, if all the young and massive stars, they have already died and the, like the, the most massive ones say it's just sun-like stars and all the other little ones there, right? Then basically we're just having um, a pretty quiet and peaceful environment as long as, you know, the stars are not really say like affecting each other um, in any way, then all these leftover stars they would have in enough uh, lifetime to, um, for, for any life to develop in its planetary system. Okay. Um, what I love about talks like this is that it always prompts for philosophical questions. And uh, uh, Matteo uh, asks, do we look for robots that behave like carbon-based life? And where do we draw that line between machines and life? I think von Neumann probes, which could spread across the galaxy very fast, act kind of like organisms on Earth in the sense that they gather materials and reproduce. Wow. I also, I also <laughs> like the philosophical questions. Um, I do remember um, when talking about, or at least when I was learning about uh, silicon-based life, uh, there was a question about, okay, whether, you know, like chips or AI, they would qualify as, um, you know, silicon-based life. So that is like, okay, what do we even, I, okay, so when, when I was presenting all those like fundamental properties of life, right, they are even, um, still gray areas and exceptions there. So the question is, we don't we don't really know how to define life, right? Um, with this one data point, we're trying to make as much generalization as we could possibly can, but you know that is not a scientific method I would recognize. Uh, I would recommend, right? Just with one data point. Um, so I would I would say you know there's it's also tied to the question regarding okay at one, what point uh artificial intelligence would consider as you know like human like or just like another intelligent life um well <laughs> i don't i don't know you're just dropping my wisdom card here um but i think even just like prompting that kind of um the discussion would be very helpful and as i said most of the things that we don't know is actually on the biological side um, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, a, a very a, a follow up question here on uh, um, uh, on Mars. Um, uh, Marshall asks, uh, Mars has red rocks, and assuming that the red is oxidized iron, uh, what was the source of oxygen that turned them red? Oh, uh, that that is great question. So I I would say. Um, one possibility is that um, there were at least um, some kind of uh, oxygen in the ancient atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So the atmosphere was gone uh, possibly because, you know, the internal magnetic field of Mars changed in, in the ancient past that eventually just like let the atmosphere to be stripped away by solar wind. But all those rocks, um, and as we could see, all those you know evidence for past water that was signaling um, the presence of an atmosphere. And I wouldn't be so surprised if there were you know oxygen there um, in the atmosphere. And actually, I think um, one process that could be happening was. Um, that the UV radiation um, coming mm. from the sun was actually like a decomposing, you know, like water molecules in there, right? So like hydrogen would directly escape and uh, oxygen would leave there. Yeah. Well, that was that was the second part of his uh, question and his observation is that, you know, you know on Earth, the reducing atmosphere was created by life. And uh, uh, but on Mars, I guess UV can take on a similar role in that regard. That's very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Xi, you, uh, on your last, on the previous question, you, you touched upon something that I wanted to comment on and ask you about, mm -hmm. which is really when we're talking about life so far, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have one data point. 
with lots of variables, but it's only one data point. Mm -hmm. And the idea that one can extrapolate in any any sense with one data point, you know, in any other science, we just die laughing, right? And even in economics, you need three data points to, to extrapolate. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I mean, I guess in that sense, astrobiology is less science than economics is, which is a dismal science. <laughs> uh, but, um, and, and one of the problems is we kind of get caught in, I think, this sort of circular reasoning, which is, we sort of tick off all the things that life needs. We say, well, it needs carbon, it needs water, it needs a magnetic field, it needs a, a, a nice star, we need, it needs a planet that's well behaved, on and on and on, you know. And, and lo and behold, the Earth matches that. Well, the reason the Earth matches that is because the Earth is shaping our perceptions of, of all the requirements for life. And I have this image right now, you know, since the universe is so big, at this very moment, undoubtedly, there is your opposite number on a methane-based planet who's explaining why methane is critical for life. <laughs> now, you could possibly not have it on, on, with water base and carbon because the chemistry doesn't work. So maybe, maybe you know, I have the feeling that our, our, we're going to be surprised. I, well, it's, I, kind of an, it's kind of an extension of the anthropic principle, yes, right? Yes, you know, exactly. and uh, we're not necessarily talking about uh, it on the scale of the universe here, but we're certainly talking about the fact that our immediate uh, habitat is our frame of reference. And it's hard for us to get beyond that. You can't talk about what you don't know. Right. And, you know, I, and I, I, you know, I, I must admit, I admit to being a carbon chauvinist, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and the, the chemistry is easier, you know, okay, and I'll add water. I'm a carbon water chauvinist. And we see plenty of places in our solar system where life is like that. And if, if I were to make a bet, I would bet that most of the life in the galaxy is, is along those lines. But I'd also be willing to bet that there's some surprises out there, that nature's got some things out there that we can't guess at, where our, our imaginations are just too limited. And I just wanted to hear your comments in that regard. Oh, I, I totally agree with you, Dave. Um, I feel this is a sort of like a survivor's bias, right? Simply yeah. just because, you know, um, we are unable to, you know, jump out of our own uh, perspective or like frame of reference. Um, and that's also why, you know, all in all the alien movies, right? Alien, <laughs> the alien faces look somewhat like a human face. Yeah. Um, and I, well, I don't think that's necessarily true. And um, so all those things, right, based on this one data point, that's the best we could do. Yeah. Um, what else could we have yeah, hypothesized? Yeah. Yeah. What choice um, do we I, have? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, there's just like so much that we don't know. Um, I don't think that we actually need to. It's almost like we're, ex exper um, we're trying to explore this like almost infinitely large amount of parameter space, right? Yeah. We're yeah. like, okay, we're running our models, but we have to start from someplace. And that's the constraint that we start from. Yeah. But then it doesn't mean that, you know, like all the other parameter space that you just throw that out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that's it. If you don't have any more questions, Dave, <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, our uh, audience is sated and uh, um, I, I don't I see do anything one more. more on, uh, oh, go, 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 is, go ahead. Go I ahead. think fire, is it Firefly? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Firefly. Yeah, I think that's just an, I, when I first heard about it. Right. Dragonfly. 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 Yeah, Firefly, I, Firefly is, a, is a good uh, science fiction show. Oh, I think it's also the name for a World War II tank, if I remember correctly, but I could be wrong with that. Could be. Uh, but uh, um, Dragonfly, when I first heard about that mission, I, I, I thought, this is, again, straight out of science fiction. A unbelievable mission. And yeah. boy, is that exciting. So uh, I want to assure our audience I'm going to have a speaker on that pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, I can't wait for that one. Yeah. Great. Oh, and I saw uh, Steve had his hand up before. Ah, oh, let me see. Um, yeah. Steve, are you there somewhere with a hand up? Because I don't see anybody right now. Ah, Steve Matthews. Okay, Steve, I'm going to allow you to talk um, if you're still there. Uh, Steve, you're uh, available. If you unmute yourself, you could ask your question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Sure. I'd like to ask a question about the 
lifetime of a technical civilization in the Milky Way galaxy. That's one of the great unknowns in the Drake equation. But I'd like to think about the possibility that there is an upper limit to that lifetime <laughs> beyond which ET can no longer remain undetected. And that would be the amount of time it takes for the ET civilization to develop interstellar transport, let's say at a tenth the speed of light. Because once ET develops that technology, they would be all over the galaxy. They'd be in our face. There'd be no way to avoid them. What do you think about that speculation? Wow. I love I love this kind of um, discussion. So um, first, I do agree. Um, I think that is a, a very reasonable speculation. Another thing that immediately came to mind um, was, you know, like drawing the example of our own human being. Um, I was thinking, okay, when will we become like undetectable, right? I mean, when our when we do ourselves in because of global warming, of course we would just like become not non-detectable. So it's more like, okay, well, the, the civilization or say like all these technology, it's like. Uh, a double-edged sword, right? It could make you e easily being detected or it could also destroy your world uh, completely. Steve, so, I, Steve, I strongly recommend reading The Three-Body Problem. <laughs> it's a wonderful science fiction novel by uh, 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 Liu Shijin. And I'll check uh, it, out. it really gets into this topic. <laughs> I will also take a look. Need to read that. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's 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 um, uh, uh, three parts. It's uh, got uh, two two sequels to it. Wonderful. Anyway, nice to hear from you, Steve. Thank you. Sure. Actually, Steve raised. Uh, I think it was Enrico Fermi that first raised this question, which is the argument. Well, why aren't they already here? You know, if you assume that you have a I think he raised this question about 48 or 49, something, 1948, 49. And the argument, of course, is that, you know, if a civilization can develop interstellar travel, well, then they go to two planets and two planets become four planets. And then eventually, within a relatively short period of time, compared with the age of the universe, they expand all across the galaxy. So the question is, he asked, well, why aren't they already here? And I wanted to throw out my hypothesis, uh -huh. which is, that for a civilization to become that old, it has to be very ethical. Otherwise, they will end up destroying themselves. Mm -hmm. And imagine you're an advanced ethical civilization and you detect us. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to treat us the way we hopefully treat the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. We, they would say, OK, nobody touches these guys. Nobody bothers these guys until they reach a certain level of development when they're ready to find out you know, about us. And so that, that is one, my, one of my possible and favorite answers for the Fermi paradox, but I'd be interested in other people's. Well, the, the, uh, in the novels I was referring to, it was the hypothesis that the, uh, that the universe is a dark forest. And the mm -hmm. last thing you wanna do is poke up your head. Yeah. And unfortunately, we've already started poking up yeah. our head with the I Love Lucy episode. <laughs> with bad television. Even <laughs> with terrible we... television. Yeah. Yeah. With all those messages that we send out. Yeah. 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 We're a noisy place. Yeah. Um, Mateo, okay. asked, Mateo asked another question. Um, do you think figuring out how the first prokaryotes came to exist uh, uh, and he thinks it's called ambiogenesis, I think you're right, uh, could help us run similar chemical reactions with other chemicals to see what other types of basic life can possibly arise. I imagine there must be researchers who do exactly this type of thing to model different types of building blocks to see what can act lifelike. Uh... I'm, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there would be. Um, and, and another, another thing is um, that I, I got reminded of is the Yuri Miller experiment. Yes. 
right? So that was a sort of like the, the first attempt um, actually trying to re reproduce all those conditions, but it's more like reproducing the conditions on earth instead of like actually studying all those uh, chemicals and see how mm. they reproduce. So from a different angle. Yeah, but I, I feel like, you know, I would be surprised if none of the biologists are actually working on this. <laughs> um, one other thing though, is like, I believe it was in 2018 or something that I read in the news uh, that there was a type of bacteria that had been sort of physicized in the lab uh, that were able to consume or metabolize carbon silicon uh, sugar. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's almost like another wow. half step, you know, towards a silicon based life. Whoa. We were just talking about this last night. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 So I, I was looking, trying to, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned this because I was trying to look for information about it. And you've kind of confirmed that, yeah, the person who was describing this was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, talking about a real event. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I had not heard of that. That's amazing. Who did that? Anybody? You guys remember? Uh, I wonder if it was at Caltech. Okay. But you have you have to also realize that if you were a silicon-based life form and you were breathing oxygen, when you would exhale, there would be sand. Right. <laughs> 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 be very uncomfortable <laughs> all right i i think i think on that note i get to have the final word <laughs> great i mean that's a that's a great place to end the discussion <laughs> um thank you all for joining us tonight um i hope you enjoyed this as much as i did and uh dave good to see you and uh Jinan, very nice to meet you and uh wish you the best well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you guys for having me. I had a great time. Um, yeah, please send us please send us the information about that uh, speaker series coming up. Definitely, yes. Okay, very we'll see good. See that Monday in your inbox. Wonderful. Okay, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>